Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you, not just me, but my wife is, is here with us. And uh, after 26 years, I think she deserves 26 medals. So darling, <laughs> won't you just stand, please? <laughs> So let's pray. Father, you have an encounter. You have an appointment with every person here today. And Father, we bring the needs. Lord, we bring our hearts. Lord, where we are desperate, even where we are indifferent. And we pray Jesus come in. Father, may we not leave this place the same. Lord, but may we be transformed. Lord, may we come on fire. Lord, may we burn, Father God, and where we need breakthrough that we might receive it. Lord, I pray that your word would transform our hearts and our lives. Lord, use me, a, just a humble vessel, and, and touch your sons and daughters, Lord God, by coming, Holy Spirit, and quickening your word to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was with you last, I spoke about my family, so I won't do that today. Um, I want to tell you quickly about two things that struck me when I went to Europe. And it's things that we've got here that they don't have in Europe. And it's so important that we cherish what we've got. So before we go to the Word, I just want to highlight two things. And um, Nicola and I, we went to our Every Nation Church in Paris, suffering for Jesus. Uh, <laughs> first time in Europe, actually. Um, Every Nation Church in Paris, Every Nation Church in Berlin, Every Nation um, Church in Madrid. And the first thing that struck me was that when we were there, these pastors planting these churches were desperate. I mean, from first thing in the morning till late at night, they were just spending time with us. And they were just so desperate for relationships and uh, so hungry. And, and I just reflected that in South Africa, there are so many relationships that we've got. And you have so many relationships, and it seems to be that we go somehow deeper. And so it's so important that you recognize and cherish, care for, and steward the men and women that God has put in your life. Here in this church, in your connect group, in your life, godly men and women who are better than you in some areas. I'm so grateful for the men in my life who are better fathers than I am, who challenge me to be a better father, or you know, better in management, or better in leadership. So we do well to cherish what we've got. The second thing that struck me is we have an atmosphere of revival in South Africa. You know, I don't know, we were out the country when uh, Uncle Angus had his, I don't know, 500,000 to a million plus prayer. I mean, it's unprecedented. When we went to the Madrid church, the senior pastor, the woman, the couple, uh, but the woman, she was in tears. And... Um, and she, and she was crying because the first Spanish woman in seven years, they've had Filipinos and they've had other cultures, but the first Spanish woman in seven years got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, we have victory weekends here on a Sunday, salvations. I mean, we are in an environment of, of revival. So our response should be, let's get out there and share the good news. Let's get out there and lay hands on people. Let's get out, get out there and trust for miracles. Because we are seeing it in our midst, and they don't have it in those countries. And it's the same thing in, in France and same thing in Berlin. And I honor them for what they're doing. But we have a window. Paul talks about a door of effective ministry, and we've got that. So cherish our relationships, and let's cherish the window of opportunity that God has given to us. Things that we should give attention to that they've got. Man, in, in the churches there, there's an attention to detail. There is an excellence. And uh, may we not become slack. May we not become, oh, we're just going to trust the Holy Spirit. Yes, let's trust the Holy Spirit all the time. But the way we do life and the way we do church and the way we do family, let's do it with excellence. Let's not allow things to slide. And the other thing is, I saw an adaptation. So you can't go onto the campuses in, in France. You can't. The law was passed. You just can't do that. You're not allowed to do it. So now they're going into the student villages. They're going into the student reses. And to go and say, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? I mean, you're going to be thrown off so fast. They're going to walk away from you so fast. So they, for instance, uh, Ryan Cayley was in this church, Every Nation, Johannesburg, rather. Uh, so he's got this great Google app. And he says, um, can I do a survey, a Christian survey with you? <laughs> and people are sure. And it's like, who do you think Jesus was? 
Was he the son of God? Was he a historical figure? And on and on it goes. And he drills down. And it's a, actually, it's a genius survey. In the Spanish church, when you arrive there on a Sunday, it's all tapas tables. And uh, before you worship God, you sit down. A word is shared for about 20 minutes. And then there's a discussion for 15, 20 minutes. Hey, what did you think of the word while you're eating your tapas, while you're drinking your coffee? Because that's the Spanish culture. You know, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody wants to talk. <laughs> and it just struck me, the message is timeless. The gospel message we, we don't compromise on. But how we bring it need, needs to ad adapt and adjust. And culture in South Africa is changing. And what we did 10 years ago, what worked five years ago, probably isn't going to work in five years' time. So reaching the millennials, reaching Generation Z, Generation Alpha, what they call possibly the next generation, we need to consider carefully and adapt our message and adapt how we do church. So th those are some things that I saw. If you've got your Bible, come with me to Matthew chapter 13. This is such an incredible story. We, in our Matthew series, Jesus has been moving in power across Judea, across Israel. He's preached probably his most important parable. In Mark, it's referred to as Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable, you can't understand any. Talking about the parable of the sower. And then he comes to his hometown. How do you feel when you come to your hometown? Or how do you feel when you come home? This is the place where you are received. This is the place where you are loved. This is the place where you are known. And it says, in coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. So that they were astonished. And said, where, this, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Note, they acknowledge that there's a grace upon him. They acknowledge that there's a wisdom upon him. They don't even deny that there's mighty works that God has been doing through him. Then they say, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So they're starting to bring him down. They're starting to move into a place of disbelief. We, we know this boy. Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. And then it says, And he did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Now it seems like they're believing at the beginning because they, they're astounded, they're marveling, they're astonished at his wisdom and his mighty works. But now it's as if they don't believe personally. And clearly they don't honor. I'm going to talk to you today about what I believe is the key for miracles, is the key for our breakthrough, for our personal breakthrough. And that is honor. And that is us truly honoring Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the key. If they had received him, I mean, they received him to an extent. They were astonished. They listened to his words. But because of their lack of honor, there weren't many miracles. Can we be people who really receive Jesus with honor? Can we live our lives in such a way that we are honoring him? And as we do that, we're going to see the miracles. We've all got friends. We've all got our crew. We've all got our people. That When we're with them, they get the very best out of us. And then there's some people, when you spend time with them, your, your throat just closes up. You, know? you start sweating. You, know? you feel awkward. And they don't get the best out of you. They don't get your jokes. You don't even tell your jokes. <laughs> they don't get the best out of you. How do we receive all that Jesus has for us? It's by honoring him. It's by truly receiving him personally. This theme of honor, sometimes it's translated as glory, runs all through Matthew and all through the New Testament. Jesus talks in Matthew 23 verse 6. He says, they love the place of honor. Do you love to be honored? If you do, it is such an idol. 
You know what an idol is? It's something that promises you something and doesn't deliver. Do not love to be honored, but love to honor. Purpose to be a person who honors Jesus in every single way. Because as you do, breakthrough, blessing, favor, miracles are going to come into your life. This theme runs all the way through Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is writing about Israel's past. He's talking to them about their rebellion. He's talking to them about their idolatry. He's talking to them about not, not seeking the good of others. And then he says this. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, so often we think, you know, we honor God by getting to church on time. And it's great that you come to church on time. And then by really singing well. <laughs> you know, by really singing a really from your heart. And that's great. Danish philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, he spoke about the theater of worship. And he says, you know, when we worship, there's a stage, there are performers, there's a director, and there's an audience. And um, our normal way of seeing this now, we're talking about honoring God, remember? We're talking about worshiping Him. The normal way that we see it, which isn't, which isn't complete, is that the stage is here at the front of the church. This is the stage. It could be a bit higher, but it's flat. But this is the stage. And the performers, and they, could, they did a great job today, great worship. The performers are at the front, and they're singing, and, and they're playing the instruments. And there's a director. Who is the director today? Just lift up your hand. Director, this is the director. Sorry, sir, what is your name? Director. <laughs> and there's an audience, all of you. And at the end of church, you go, mm, I really enjoyed worship today, or mm, it didn't work for me. That's the way things usually work, and they shouldn't work that way. A biblical way to see it, to see honor, and to see worship is this way. That all of us are on the stage. Not those people who stand up here, but all of us are on the stage. And the stage isn't just what's in this building, but it's the whole of life. The whole of life is the stage. And the performers, you and I. You and I are the performers. And who's the director? The Holy Spirit. And who's the audience? Jesus. <laughs> God is the audience. So it's not like, hey, did worship work for you? You know, The question is not whether you enjoyed worship. It's did Jesus enjoy your worship? <laughs> not did you enjoy the worship. <laughs> did Jesus enjoy your worship? We are here to honor Him. We are here to glorify Him. And as we do, the miracles come. As we live lives of honor, we get the very, very, very best of Jesus. We become like that beloved disciple. Remember John, the beloved disciple? He's described as the beloved disciple. Why? Not because Jesus had favorites, but because he pressed in, because he honored him. So within every nation across the world, our mission statement is we exist to honor God. Right at the front end, of who and what we are as a people around the world, 70 nations, we exist not for the honor of man or for our local church or for our giftings or for our vision. We exist to honor God. And it's not a small thing. It's a huge thing. Because when you are no longer pursuing your agenda, when you're no longer pursuing what's good for you, but you're pursuing to honor Him, it changes everything. It changes the way you approach every single thing. So this actually gets very practical. It's not just about Sundays. It's primarily not about Sundays. It's about every aspect of your life. Do we need a statement? Do we need the statement, honor God? In our mission you know there's a propensity there's a temptation that when we become wealthy when we become famous when we get that 
beautiful wife, when we get those wonderful children, when we get that incredible church, when we get success, that we become intoxicated with our success. And we forget it was us praying and saying, Lord, won't you bless me? <laughs> won't you help me? Won't you give me that job? Won't you give me that breakthrough in this business? Won't you give me breakthrough in relationship? And then God answers us. And then we go, gee, I'm such a legend. <laughs> And we forget, we're the ones who cried out in our weakness and in our need, and God answered us. The statement that we live to honor God should align us towards doing everything for Him and for His honor. You travel across the world today, and there are tens of thousands of denominations. You know that. In some cities, there's a church every, like, like 100 meters, sometimes every 50 meters. And I don't believe that's to the honor and the glory of God that there's such disunity. But I believe people have chosen to honor themselves or to chosen to go their own way. God's honor should always be the starting point and the end point. And one of the most powerful pieces of theology is described as the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it says this, man's chief end is to glorify God. And you could put honor God. Man's chief end is to honor God and to enjoy Him forever. In other words, it's from the heart. When it says to enjoy Him forever, it's not like I'm, I'm not doing because I have to. I do it because I want to. I do it because it is wonderful. And it is my desire from deep within my heart to honor Him. Now, one of my favorite people in the Bible is David. And we know the story of David. How, as, as a young man, he steps up and he takes on Goliath. David says to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel all those gathered there will know that it is not my sword or spear that the Lord saves but the battle is the Lord's he will give all of you into our hands David is described as a man after God's own heart David is described as a man who fulfilled the purpose of God now what was it about him was it that he was exceptionally courageous I don't think so was it that he had like built in no fear? <laughs> no. I believe what caused David to be a man after God's own heart, what caused David to stand head and shoulders, although he was shorter than Saul. Saul, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody, but stand head and shoulders in the spirit was that he lived for the honor and glory of God. And when he saw the Lord's name being brought into disrepute, he said, this should not be. That this Philistine brings, blasphemes the Lord. Note what, he's, what he says here. His passion is for the honor and the glory of God. If you'll be a man, if you'll be a woman who says, I, wa I want to do things for his honor. Watch and see how God blesses you. Watch and see how your business, your career, your relationships change. When no longer are you doing this for your own honor and glory. But everything like David, you're saying, I want his name to be lifted up. I want him to be glorified. So why do we honor God? So simply, because he is the head of the body, the church. There's only one Makula boss. It's not me. It's not Pastor Carol. It's not Mike. You know, it's Jesus. <laughs> it's God. He is the firstborn. He is the beginning, firstborn amongst the dead, so that in everything, Jesus Christ might have supremacy. Secondly, why do we honor him? Because apart from him, we can do nothing. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. All good things are, are from him, are through him, and they should be to him. And that's sometimes where we run amiss. 
because we cry out <laughs> and he starts to move and then we start to take the glory. Has anybody ever said to you, man, you're such a nice person? I hope people have said that to you. Has anybody ever said to you, what makes you so nice? Has anybody said that to you? And then have you said, well, it's just my personality. <laughs> On um, Sunday after church, Sunday afternoon, I took Nicola and we, we walked through Rosebank Mall. And um, because we were, I was anticipating our anniversary, I wanted to buy her a dress. So we went into Fashini's and uh, we found this dress and it was a great price. And I said to her, let me go get it for you. And so she was wandering around Fashini's and, and I walk up to, um, to the till and God just moves. I mean, literally, God moves. There's two people there and the Holy Spirit moves and... One starts crying. I mean, it just started off with thankfulness. That he said it's good to be thankful. And I started to say, oh, thankfulness opens doors of blessing. And, and then God started to show. But they were impressed with me. You know, at that particular moment. I mean, they were. You know, sometimes people are impressed with you. People are struck by you. And that's your moment to quickly, <laughs> very quickly say, it's Jesus. Very quickly, point upwards. Reflect upwards and say, it's God. And we did it. And, and I said, listen, you think I'm nice. Wait till you meet my wife. And then I called her over and said, honey. <laughs> you know? And we spoke about what Jesus had done. When people look at you and they see your life and they see the blessing of your life and they see the favor of your life and they see that things are in order and your family and your finances and all these things, will you give him honor? Will you give him glory? Will his name quickly be on your lips? Or will you take the glory? Three things to understand about honoring God. Firstly, it starts from the heart. It should be our passion. It should be our desire. Because of our love for him. Because of what he has done for us. Myth, Mark chapter 7. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, so why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So glad you're here this morning. So glad you came to church. <laughs> But God is after, not the outward, he's after the inward. He's after us honoring him from our hearts. And you know what? As you honor him from your hearts, everything follows. How you honor him with your body, how you honor him with your finance, everything follows. The Greek word for honor, I won't even tr try to pronounce it. <laughs> but it means it originates in our hearts. And it refers to the value that we personally place on someone. And to honor means to value, to revere, to esteem to the highest degree. Did I jump one? Sorry. Secondly, honoring means to worship him in spirit and in truth. In Mark chapter 7 says, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. As I said to you, worship is not just about being here on a Sunday. It's not just about singing great songs. It's about every aspect of our lives being perceived and seen as worship unto him. Many of you have read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, The Seven Stories. He also wrote a trilogy, an adult fiction book, and fantasy fiction, as it were. And in it, he talks about the great dance. And the great dance was a medieval concept. So it was very well known in those times. And, it, and this was the concept that every single planet was rotating, and as it rotated around the sun, it was singing a tune. And all the stars, similarly, as they moved through the galaxy, were singing a tune. And all the galaxies together. So there was this 
immense symphony. Then it went on to say, but not just that, but come down to earth. Every human and every animal and every plant and every blade of grass and every molecule and every atom and everything has got its part to play in the great dance. That everything is part of and meant to be part of a symphony to the glory of God. Can, can you consider your life to be part of a symphony? And you play your part and you play it well. And you play it in tune. <laughs> And you play it to the honor and glory of God. And you don't be like, no, no, I don't want to be a violin. I want to be a trombone. <laughs> Each of us have got a part to play. And if we play it well, God receives honor and we receive reward. And blessing and breakthrough come. Don't look at your brother and sister and go like, well, I'm not playing the trombone. I'm not going to play. Just because I don't get to preach, I'm not going to come to church. Just because I'm not in the worship team, I'm not going to worship. Let each of us play our part. Let us worship in spirit and truth. It's far more than what happens on a Sunday. It's our entire lives to His glory. And honoring God means obeying His word. There's no way around it. We do not adjust God's word to our situation. Our situation must adjust to God's word. God's word is the final authority of our values, of our conduct, of our doctrine, of our beliefs, of our lives. You know, one of the first things that came into the church, the first heresies, was something called Gnosticism. Special knowledge. And um, the essence of Gnosticism was what you do with your body and your life doesn't matter. Kind of as long as you say Jesus is Lord, it doesn't matter what you do with the rest of your life. And it's just not true. And um, you see it today. Gnosticism has creeped back in. You know, as long as I declare Jesus is Lord, it doesn't matter what I do. Monday through to Saturday. But the truth of the matter is, we honor Him by obeying Him. We don't obey Him for salvation's sake. We can't earn our salvation. It's by grace through faith. But having been touched, having been changed, having truly met with Him, having encountered Him, from our hearts there should be such a desire to honor Him and to speak of Him and to obey Him. So when it comes to honoring Him, there's two axes. There's what is seen and what is unseen. There's a whole lot of our life that is unseen. It's with the iceberg. And there's a whole lot that people don't see. And as far as honoring is concerned, there's a giving and there's a receiving. And we do them and are meant to do all of them. So your tithing and your giving is giving, obviously. And it's unseen. Nobody knows. We don't audit. We don't know if, if you give of your tithes and offerings. But we honor God through our substance, through giving of our finances. Prayer is unseen. Nobody knows if you pray or not. <laughs> Nobody knows if you spend time with Jesus during the week. But we are called to honor him through our prayer. You know your rest, resting, is an act of faith. We understand that Jesus is ultimately our Sabbath, and you can read that in Hebrews. But there's a sabbatical principle. And you know what that principle says? Is that I will honor God by taking rest once a week. Pastors, we do it on a Monday or a Friday. And, but I encourage you to do it. Because if you're just working, 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 you're not trusting in Him. You are meant to honor Him even in your rest. By taking a day off that you give unto the Lord. That doesn't mean you come to church the whole day. <laughs> but you give unto Him and that you rest and you don't work. Through word. Through your relationships. You can't say that you love God and then hate your brother. You can't say you love God, but there's deep bitterness inside of you. We love God by how we operate in our relationships. How you treat those around you. Are their names safe on your lips? Do you speak to people or do you speak about people? How you operate towards your children. How you are towards your husband and wife. How you are towards people those who have hurt you. You honor God by how you operate in relationships. Or not. How you do your work. How you do your ministry. 
not as people who do it when your boss is watching you, when he's monitoring, you know, but as unto the Lord, that you honor God in how you work. Not according to what is seen, but according to what is from the heart. And worship is classically defined. I want to talk to you about when you wake up in the morning. What is the first thing you do? Do you reach for your cell phone? I want to confess that's what I used to do. Who of you, who's willing to confess that the first thing you do is you look at WhatsApp messages and look at Facebook when you wake up in the morning? Okay, so this is what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to be like, first thing in the morning, I wake up and I go, thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful day. I want my waking in the morning to be honoring to him. And then I make coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Exercise. You know, I see too many people. I'm in my 50s now. I I see too many people in their 50s and 60s who haven't stewarded themselves the way they eat and the way they exercise. And so when they should be at their prime in terms of productivity and life, they're on this rapid decline. I'm talking about pastors. I'm talking about business people. You know, you are called to honor God by the way you eat and that you steward your body. Can I get an amen, somebody? Some of you, somebody who plays sport, just say, yes, pastor. (laughs) Do you honor God in the traffic? As somebody cuts you off, do you go back, Lord Jesus, bless them. (laughs) Or do you pull down curses upon them? We are called to honor him in all circumstances. Do you honor God by sleeping enough? Some of you, some of you are sleeping less than seven hours, less than six hours, and you're just running your body hard. And you need to stop doing that. And you need to start stewarding yourself by getting enough sleep. Do you honor God in your marriage? You know, the Bible talks about if, if a man is harsh with his wife, God won't hear his prayers. So how's that for a sure way? How's that for a sure way of not living in the blessing of God? Honoring God opens up the blessing. Honoring Him. But it's not just with your lips, but it's with every aspect of your life. Your parenting. Do you, address, do you come about your parenting with faith and diligence? That you are taking this treasure that you've been given and you're trusting to release them into the fullness of their destiny? Are you praying for your children every day? Are you watching where they're at? Do you know? You know, so many of us know, you know, who's, who's on the rugby team, Springbok rugby team, but you couldn't tell me who your kids' three best friends are. I mean, it shouldn't be that way. We need to know where our kids are at. This is an area for me where I struggle. Okay, Just maintaining keeping up with things so my pool's a bit green at the moment you know so i confess that (laughs) and i'm working on it but we are called to do everything to the glory and to the honor of god gk chesterton says the following because children have a bounding vitality because they are in spirit fierce and free therefore they want things repeated and unchanged they always say do it again And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessarily that he makes all days alike. It may be that God makes every day separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has an eternal appetite of infancy or youth. And for we have sinned and grown old. And our father is younger than we. Can you wake up every morning and say, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this new day. Thank you for what I've got. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my spouse. I glorify you in what I have. Can you honor God today and tomorrow and tomorrow, even if things don't change. Because that's what it means. That our hearts stay fresh, our hearts are thankful, our hearts are full of faith. 
And as we do that, the blessing of God comes upon our lives. Coming to a close. Can you honor God in your success? Can you bring your desires before Him and honor God in that? Can you honor God in your strength and your ambition? And not all ambition is bad. And can you honor God in your pleasure? Do everything to the glory and the honor of God. You know, the, you know where we get cappuccinos from? There's a, there's a bunch of Catholic monks called the Capuchin monks. And they decided to take roasted beans and frothy milk and do it to the glory of God. And aren't you glad that there's cappuccinos today? <laughs> And we could carry on talking about things like Guinness beer and all kinds of things that people did to the honor and the glory of God. Can you honor God in every single area? Sometimes we are called to honor God in things that we're not so happy with. In Jeremiah chapter 29, which is so well known, where it talks about, for I know the plans I have for you. But remember the context. It was in exile. It was far from home. And it says, seek the peace of the city in which I've called you. Pray for it, because if it prospers, you will too. So can you honor God even in that waiting place? Can you honor God in the place of weakness? Can you honor God even in the place of seeming failure and fears? Can you honor God in anger and in conflict? The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Not all anger is wrong. And can you honor God in the mundane? Can you honor Him every day? We'll begin to close. Second last slide, sorry. C.S. Lewis wrote Screwtape Letters. Some of you are familiar with it. And in Screwtape Letters, it's the advice of an older demon to a younger demon. Uh, it sounds terrible, but it's actually very good. All right? Because it shows what's going on, uh, you know, how the enemy tries to mess with our minds. So it's an older demon giving advice to a younger demon. And he says this to him. He says, keep his mind off the most elementary duties, but directing it to the most advanced and spiritual ones. Aggravate the most useful of human characteristics, the horror and neglect of the obvious. He continues. He said, I've had patience of my own. He calls him patience. That's us humans. I've had patience of, them, of my own. They could be turned at a moment's notice from prayer for their wife's soul to beating their wife without a thought. We are called to honor God in everything. And as we honor God in everything, breakthrough and blessing and power comes. I want us to bring our hearts before the Lord. I'm not perfect in this area. I told you about my green pool. <laughs> but can we bring those areas that God is putting his finger on and just reconsecrate ourselves and say, God, I'm going to honor you in every way. Instead of, instead of being those Sunday specials and we're actually functionally atheist because the world can't tell any difference between us and them. We just come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are here to honor you. We exist to honor you. Lord, we, we think of you coming to Nazareth and you could not do many miracles because of the lack of honor. And Lord, we are so desperate for breakthrough. We're so desperate for miracles. We're so desperate for your hand upon our lives you going before us so Lord I repent and, and we repent of, of where we are not honoring you if you want to consecrate yourself in a particular area I'm not going to ask you to come to the front but even as I'm praying if, if you need to consecrate yourself and say God I'm going to honor you in this I haven't in the past or I've been doing a really bad job and you want to say today, today, I'm purposing to honor you in this area. And just stand to your feet now. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you that you give grace to the humble. 
You resist the pride, but you give grace to the humble. Lord, as we are standing here, my desire, and you see it, is to honor you. And so we pray, Lord God, for grace. We pray for strength. And we purpose to honor you. Honor you with our bodies. Honor you with our lives. Honor you with our words. Honor you with our relationships. Honor you with our finances. Honor you with our jobs. With every aspect of our lives. Lord, we repent where we have not been doing it. And we say, come in, Jesus. Tweak us and, and change us. And help us, Lord God. We look to you now, Lord God. Just do business with God right now. Your repentance is usually not hard drama, but it's just a steady drumbeat. Just repent. It's not doing it your way. let this word burn in your heart Jesus we desire you we want you Lord God we want your breakthrough and we want your blessing and so Lord God we pray may we honor you in every way grace is for this we pray in Jesus name